Hi, and welcome back. This is the second part uh, for our, our, our two-part sequence for week four. And we are looking at the DC to DC converter, specifically the buck converter, which has a higher input voltage and steps it down to a lower output voltage. And in this video segment, we're going to be looking at how to size the capacitor. In the last video, we looked at the duty cycle and the relationship between the input and the output as it relates to the duty cycle. And we also looked at equations on how to size the inductor based on a requirement of ripple current through that inductor. I'll provide the link in the video description, but you can get more information on the buck converter at this TI application note. Uh, by Bridget Hawk. Let's look over the overview for this, this video sequence. One of the things I want to touch on is looking at the buck converter as a DC chopper, and I probably didn't do a, a good enough job of that in the past video, so I kind of want to review that buck converter again. And one of the things you'll see, it's really a DC chopper circuit with some filtering uh, attached to it. Uh, we'll review again the equations that govern the output voltage and the inductor sizing. And then finally, we'll finish up with deriving a design equation on how to size the filter capacitor. And that will be based on the requirement for the ripple voltage across the load. Again, here's the high level schematic of the buck converter. It consists of a high side switch and a low side switch that act in tandem and we can switch back and forth in tandem and connect the inductor to the DC input voltage, v, v in. And as I said, this really is acting like a DC chopper. If we plot the node voltage here, VA, as a function of time, we see that it is providing a chopped DC signal with an average output that is proportional to the duty cycle. And our duty cycle is D, so we see that the average value of A is equal times D times our input voltage. And that's our average value for the output as well. So the buck converter in one, one aspect can be thought of as a DC chopper. To help illustrate that, I started installing the components that would go into a buck converter. So on the high side switch, we're typically going to have a MOSFET. For the low side switch, there are two ways to do it, but one way is to, to provide a diode, and that diode is acting as a flyback. And so in conduction, it's, its potential across the diode is nearly zero, and so it's nearly a short circuit when conducting. And we have an inductor and a resistor, a capacitor in the, the load side of the DC chopper. So again, one way to look at it as a DC chopper. We typically rearrange a more standard drawing of the buck converter. And if you go into literature, you will typically see the buck converter arranged in this way. There are topologies where this flyback diode, which is acting as our low side switch, is replaced by a MOSFET that is also controlled by a gate driver. That's called a synchronous buck converter. So when that flyback diode is replaced by a MOSFET that's working in tandem with the high side MOSFET, it's called synchronous buck converter. I just wanted to review quickly the equations that govern the ripple current through the inductor. First, based on the ripple current, and here's the ripple current through the inductor, we see that the average output current is equal to I max plus I min divided by two. The ripple current proper, which I'm labeling I, Delta I sub O is equal to I max minus I min. And we can get equations for I max 
given the ripple current and the average output current, and likewise we could obtain an equation for the minimum value of current, it's the average output minus one half of the ripple. In the past video, we derived the equation for sizing the inductor given requirements for the ripple uh, current and the output voltage and the duty cycle. And one of the equations was L is equal to V times one minus D all over the switching frequency, which is the reciprocal of the switching period times the ripple current. The application note from TI, if you dig into that a little deeper, will rewrite this equation as VO times VN minus VO all over delta IO times FS times VN. And you can see that it's the same equation as above. And finally, um, if we know the, the load resistance or we know the range of the load resistance R, then we can size this as RL times one minus D F of S times delta I, the, the ripple current divided by the average output. Uh, and as I said in the last video, I tend to like this one because oftentimes the design requirement is that the ripple current can only be say 40% or 20% or 10% of the average output for all ranges of load. So if you know what the power supply is supposed to be designed for, for its average power output, its average voltage output, we can obtain a range of load resistance, and again, I'm gonna assume resistance, and design to that. But all three of these equations for the sizing of the inductor are valid. Now let's look at how we size the the, the capacitor and the sizing for the capacitor is going to be based on the ripple voltage. And there's, a, there's going to be an assumption that we make. And the assumption is that the load current through the resistor is constant. And if that is the case, then we can do KCL at this, at this output node. And we see that from KCL there, the inductor current is equal to the output current plus the current in the capacitor. Or solving for the current in the capacitor, we see that the current that flows through the capacitor is equal to the current flowing through the inductor less the average output current flowing through the load, which is plotted over here, which is the, again, the inductor current less the average output. And one of the things we see that during the time, this is DTS, when the switch is on, the inductor current is starting to ramp up. However, the current in the capacitor flowing through the capacitor is negative, which means the current is actually flowing in this direction to support the current that is coming through the conductor. And at which point the current reaches our average output and then it switches and the current goes positive and starts to charge up. So in this segment where the current is positive, the capacitor is charging. And in this segment, 
the capacitor is discharging. We can use that charging and discharging of the capacitor to obtain a relationship of the voltage across that capacitor. So let's go to there next. So again, in the portion where the current is positive, which we show here, that means the capacitor is charging up. And if we look from here to here, that is the portion of time at which the capacitor is charging. This will provide us with the equation to obtain delta V or the ripple across the capacitor. We know that the current through the capacitor, I, is equal to C dV dt. And we can use the charge, and the charge as it charges up is this net area. So delta Q over delta T, which is the average current, is equal to C delta V over delta, delta T. The delta T's cross out. And, and in order to find the change in voltage as it as it relates to the capacitor, we just need to find how much charge or change of charge is going on. This period of time is equal to the switching frequency divided by two. And that's not obvious, but uh, go ahead and, 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 and dig into the math a little bit in the graphs and you'll see that that is, is in fact true. We can find the net charge by looking at the area, and that area, it's a, it's a triangle, so it's one half the base times the height. So one half, and the base is Ts over two, and the height is, is I max, which is also delta Io divided by two, and that is equal to the capacitance times the ripple voltage, delta V. We can now solve for the capacitor, and the capacitor is equal to delta IO divided by eight. I'm going to solve in terms of frequency and take the reciprocal of the sample period, FS, all divided by delta V. So if we know the ripple current through the inductor and we have a specification for the ripple voltage across the capacitor and we know the switching frequency, we can then size the capacitor accordingly. So this is the equation that relates the ripple voltage across the capacitor, which eventually is across the load uh, relative to the ripple current and the switching frequency. Let's review the key points. It's all about switching. Uh, we're gonna keep hammering that home. You recall in the earlier videos, we looked at high side switching, low side switching. And in this video, we showed that uh, one way to think about the buck converter, it's a DC chopper type of circuit. And then finally, for sizing the capacitor, increasing the frequency at which we PWM our buck converter can result in a smaller capacitor. It also can result in smaller inductor. But what we'll show in some uh, future videos, it's going to come at the expense of switching loss in that high side and low side switches. So while we can increase and get smaller capacitors and inductors, it comes at a price. So thanks for watching. Uh, in the next videos, we're gonna start looking at the loss in the buck converter and start analyzing the efficiency of the buck converter. Again, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the future videos.